Today we're taking a look at the AMD Radeon 7 Vega graphics card. We will be disassembling it, looking at the PCB and the cooler. The embargo for today does not allow for performance reviews, so that's the only thing that is restricted currently is the performance numbers. Uh, that would include thermals, gaming, stuff like that. But anything physically with the card we can do for today. So uh, we're going to give you a look at the PCB. AMD typically does pretty high on PCBs for the reference cards. They've been good in the past. And then we're going to look at the new cooler, which is a triple fan axial design, and see how it all kind of fits together. And if AMD can use fewer screws than, I suppose, NVIDIA. That would be the goal here today. So let's... Uh, Let's take it apart. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their high-end thermal compounds. Thermal Grizzly makes cryonaut paste for high thermal performance and conductivity without being electrically conductive, so you don't have to worry about shorting components. Cryonaut is particularly good for replacing stock GPU pastes, as cryonaut is a non-curing compound. Learn more at the link in the description below. So here's Radeon 7. Uh, as you can see, this is pretty similar, if not the same, as the one that was at CES and it does not have any uh, secondary vBIOS, which was a bit of a change from previous AMD reference designs, but it is a, a PCB we need to look at and see if it's high-end, similar to the Vega cards. They were actually pretty good PCBs, and AMD did well on those designs. The card itself has the same screw placement for the most part as previous Vega cards. These are Torx, I think they're TR6 screws, and then the rest of them are just Phillips for the most part. Uh, you can see that we have the Aluminum fin stack with either a vapor chamber or, I mean, just standard heat pipe cooling. I, that does kind of look like a, well, we'll see when we take it apart. It's hard to tell from here. Actually, there are heat pipes in there. And then dual or triple axial design. And this is actually sort of similar, uh, although I don't have any reason to suspect they use the same manufacturer or anything, but sort of similar to a very old XFX design, which beyond being interesting, there's not a whole lot to be gained from knowing that. It's just we wanted to show it because the Ghost was kind of a cool series. All right, so let's just get to taking it apart so we have some actual content here to look at. Like I said, I think these are TR6. That is typically what AMD uses for Torx. So let's find that. So this is actually uh, Torx 8. Torx 8, but it's not security Torx. So that's good. That makes it a bit easier to take apart in the very least. And there are one, two, three, for five of these, I don't feel any beneath the stickers. People like to hide stuff in there sometimes. We're going to just place these on the GN mod mat, which uh, should be shipping about now. If you go to store.gamersnexus.net and you want a work surface like this one, you can find one there to work on, track screws, get wiring diagrams, stuff like that. So we have just a couple more of these. We'll speed through them. All right, that was very easy. Small hole here for a screw to come through the PCB out of the uh, I.O. And then this placement is actually significantly different from the other Vega cards. That's because the other ones have a single fan, and it's right here. And they use three smaller screws to hold those in place, with the rest being larger Phillips screws throughout the board. This one, uh, obviously, a bit different given that it is triple axial. Let's just remove this bracket first and see if the cooler comes off easily. Does that say warranty void? Aye, aye, aye. Okay. Andy, we're going to have to have the talk here. These stickers are not enforceable in the U.S. And uh, just in general, it's kind of ethically wrong to discourage a consumer from maintaining the product that they, they purchased. There are reasons to void a warranty. This is not one of them because there's no real risk here. And uh, XFX does similar things with theirs where... They even got into a, an argument with us on Twitter where they ultimately kind of conceded and said, well, we don't enforce it in the U.S. Like, because, okay, because you can't. So uh, it's only enforced in regions where we can screw people over. So warranty voided for move stickers. We are very, very much opposed to these. Uh, also, does it say removed? Yes. I mean, it's not, it's not removed anyway. It's... Uh, it's modified. It's not removed, though. The sticker's still there. So you could argue that if you needed to. All right, a couple Phillips screws after this. Let's see if that cooler's loose, though. Nope. So those screws are going into the base plate, which will secure the PCB to the base plate. Now, uh, in the very least, so far, this is 
about the same level of difficulty as the uh, RTX cards, the FE cards, so that's good. The question will come of whether they can defeat NVIDIA and be more complex, and I think the answer will be no. Uh, NVIDIA's FE designs are completely insane, the way they're built, to a point that if you wanted to, to fully disassemble the card and get access to the fans to clean or, uh, clean, clean or fix the fans or something like that, you would need to take out about 76 screws on the NVIDIA cards, the high-end ones, and also you would need a uh, heat gun at like a couple hundred degrees Celsius, maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, I think we ran at like 400 Fahrenheit, something like that, 500 Fahrenheit, to melt the glue, because NVIDIA uses glue. So, so far AMD's doing a bit better than that, which is good to see. I think it will be easier to try and remove the I.O. plate, although one of those screws is under the heat sink, so that will be a bit difficult. So two larger screws back here go into the shroud of the cooler, and then the rest go into like the HDMI and DisplayPort connections. So that pivots a bit. Oh, there's one more screw I missed in here. We're going to have to separate that cable. I see a thermal pad trying to come off too. Jesus, okay. I'd just like to go on record saying I specifically hate that type of connector. <laughs> They're very difficult to work with uh, without ripping the connector off the PCB itself. But we did it, and wow, what the f oh my god. All right, so we did a cut here to do some research, and this is actually a thermal pad, and if we look really close, it's a it's a bit better than just a thermal pad. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is in a second. We did figure that out. But uh, if you look really closely and at the right angle of light, you will see that there's an indentation of the HBM right here and of the GPU right here. So it is, in fact, making full contact. Okay, so kind of difficult to show, but there is, in fact, uh, indentations there showing contact. So it's making contact, which is better than what I suspected. And that's because it's a pad, not a paste. And we did some research here and also reached out to AMD. And what we learned is that this is a, uh, it's a new thermal interface from what we understand. This is a Hitachi HM03 solution. And we have the data sheet for this. So Hitachi's data sheet says, I'll just quote it here, it's a graphite resin high thermal conductivity sheet that they refer to as a graphite sheet in which graphite filler is vertically oriented. That would be in this thing here. And it says, although graphite material has high thermal conductivity, simplex particles themselves are hard, so they have problems in both flexibility and adhesion. Therefore, it was difficult to achieve a good balance between high thermal conductivity and flexibility. And then Hitachi goes on to say how their solution fixes this problem. Uh, the data sheet also suggests that it's got a thermal conductivity of 40 to 90 watts per meter Kelvin. They say it's an effective thermal conductivity, which may be orientation based, I'm not sure, of 25 to 45. And so this is a graphite sheet is what this is. And uh, that is why part of it got torn off here. Now, like I said, we've already done all of our testing, so that's not going to impact anything. But um, what I, I will be doing after this is probably removing this sheet completely. And uh, we have a couple test plans for it. And then, well, I, I won't go into them here because, well, I mean, we'll just, just come back for the review and you can see what we do with it. Uh, so thermals will be really interesting for the review. So theoretically, this has a higher thermal conductivity than paste. It's just that uh, th what are the reasons for using it is the question. There are two primary reasons we can think of. One is that if AMD is really time constrained here and needs to get this out the door, this is potentially faster to get done uh, maybe fewer issues. A lot of people don't know that video cards are typically assembled by hand, actually. There's not much machine involved at all. So this might help there. Alternatively, it could be that uh, this one, although it is all, let's get a shot of the die in the HBM here. You can see that this is a resin coated die. So there's functionally zero difference in height. I, like, I mean, there's not any difference there. I, I could measure it with tools and we would see no difference. That's because it's resin or it's got an epoxy resin on top of it. And this is something we saw before. Maybe we can find a shot of our old pressure paper test we did for Vega, where 
uh, some of the dyes would be resin and epoxy coated like this, and others that were manufactured in different facilities would have dye height differences between the HBM and the GPU, and this caused some problems like for Power Colors card previously. So maybe the thermal pad might be a solution to that. It's a bit thicker. Uh, it should conform a bit better. So maybe that's a solution, but that's only going to be a solution if AMD still has the multiple packaging facilities creating different heights between the HBM and the GPU. And, and we're not sure what the case is because we have a sample size of one and no one's posted pictures yet because it's before embargo lift. So we'll find out more about this uh, a bit later for the review. Let's go through the rest of the cooler, though. This, this is very interesting. I'm not going to scrape any of it off right now. We'll do some other testing with this stuff. Uh, as for the rest, so PCB is pretty simple in terms of basic layout. You've got uh, the, the hookups here for fan cables and for, I guess, LEDs or something, uh, power for LEDs, and then some thermal pads that fortunately are easy to peel off this time. So this thermal pad is on top of the, uh, the VRM MOSFETs, and we'll look more closely at those right now. And we have a, let's see, let's see if I can read one of these. That's an International Rectifier 35401M, that one down there. And we'll talk to Build, we'll, we'll pitch this over to Buildzoid. I don't know if this is an existing board design. I don't have Vega memorized anymore, but it does not look the same. It might be the same as the uh, Instinct stuff. We'll ask him. IDA 21472, International Rectifier. So there are... How many of these? One, two, three, four on this this line here. And we have some other MOSFETs under these pads. So this is a um, sort of an L-shaped VRM, which is technically a bit more efficient. They can do this because there's no GDDR memory. It's all HBM on the uh, interposer, which is on top of the substrate. So that does give more board space to do stuff. Those look like the same thing. This pad's a bit different. Let's look at this one. Well, that's because there's nothing there. Okay. So there's some spots for stuff there, but no actual MOSFETs. This one, these are, again, I believe the same. So we end up with this for the VRM once we take all the pads off here. And again, um, we'll talk to Buildzoid about this. If it's a new PCB, then, uh, then we'll have him do an analysis on it. But there's our VRM. We also have uh, some items of interest on the back. So there's an IR35217 right here. So 35217 for a controller, international rectifier. And then I think that's all there is on the back. Mm, yes, that, that pretty much sums up the back of the board for areas of interest. On the front, there's an Another IR35217 that's down here. And then we have another small VRM uh, component over here. That looks like the same IR parts that we saw a second ago. OK, so that covers the PCB. No secondary VBIOS or anything like that. But uh, you get a, a brief look at the VRM and some interesting characteristics for the thermal solution, which, we'll, again, we'll talk more about that later. But you do have the basics. You probably won't hear elsewhere for a little while. So that is a Hitachi pad, the HM03 graphite pad. Sort of interesting solution. Uh, higher thermal conductivity does not mean better. Thinner means better. And this is not particularly thin. But it might be a more suitable solution if there are manufacturing tolerance differences um, from the packaging plants. So let's get the, the rest of the cooler out if we can. You can actually tell that this is a vapor chamber over here, it's, it is connected to pipes, which is sort of interesting. But the way you can tell it's a vapor chamber is because uh, in the right light, you can see the circles right here. And if you cut this open, those would actually be just small copper cylinders. And those are used to, uh, to sort of keep the gap inside of the vapor chamber you know, so that it doesn't, I guess, collapse on itself. But, um, but that is indicative of a vapor chamber typically. Let's, let's get this off, though, and just confirm everything. So I think for this, we need some small torque screws. Five, and actually it's, it's technically not TR because it's not a security screw, but close enough. This is so far much easier to disassemble than the uh, RTX parts that we looked at previously. So that's at least an improvement in maintaining the fans. 
getting to the thermal solution isn't too bad either, as you saw. Okay, so that just lifts out. Just make sure we're careful of the cables. All right, base plate, cooler, and then fans. The fans are uh, First D, apparently, is the brand. They are DC fans, of course, uh, 0.32 amps, 12 volt. So that's your fan spec. And if you did want to replace one, exactly. The model number, so it's First first Do, I guess, is the brand. The Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, I mean, doesn't tell us a whole lot, but the fans were made in uh, November, at least, of last year. So uh, FD... 801-5H12S is the model if you ever need to replace one of these. These are 10 millimeter heat pipes. They are flat heat pipes. Uh, the reason that companies do flat like this as opposed to round is it does increase the surface area. So the contact area to the fins, which these are the L-shaped flat fins on the bottom to improve, increase contact surface area. The contact area to the fins is increased by doing that. And then they just solder between the fin. Yes, that is solder between the fin and the heat pipe. Pretty standard stuff. So here's a same sort of vapor chamber standoffs as on the previous Vega cards. Another giveaway of vapor chamber is that tail right there. So it looks like the world's smallest heat pipe. That's just where the vapor chamber is closed off. So this is a vapor chamber. Uh, again, the, the biggest giveaway is just that you can see those little copper dents all through the whole thing. That's not really imperfections. That's just where there are uh, cylinders inside to support the thing. And then we have heat pipes. So there's two, four, five heat pipes. And uh, only really two and a half of those go through the relevant area, which would be the GPU itself. Well, actually, we don't even know where they go through. They just seem to just, I guess they just terminate. Let's see. OK, so stand corrected. I don't think they terminate. Uh, it looks like these actually do go sort of from this perspective under the vapor chamber down here and uh, then connect to the fins or the fin stack. So anyway, about two and a half of those in the GPU area, which is the relevant area. And the rest is just L-shaped fins for contact to the base plate, which is right here. And uh, the orientation of the base plate would be roughly this, except flipped. So there's your cooling solution. Really pretty simple stuff. It's not like they, they don't have any increased surface area on the base plate. It's just a contact plate is what it is. And in fact, there's not any thermal interface between the base plate and the cooler itself either. Um, so I think there's some direct contact going on here maybe. We'd have to look at the PCB again uh, between the inductors. or Actually, the, those are just uh, um, clearance holes for caps and things. So pretty, pretty simple cooler. Vapor chamber and heat pipes is what it is. And here's the top side just because it looks kind of cool. We'll show you that so you can see the fin stack, which is clearly got to have a lot of clearance for these fans that AMD has switched to, so that would sock it down like this. And then, I mean, the question at this point is, you know, where's your air going? So with the fins oriented vertically like this, as opposed to horizontally like this, the air will only have one way to escape, and that's going to be up and down, and uh, it'll get guided by the fins. You might have a little bit coming out over here, over here, just because there's no and nothing really blocking it. But once you put this thing down, uh, there's there's a bit of pathway to escape there at the bottom, which would go into the motherboard. So that's, that's not the best place for the air to escape. At the top, unfortunately, uh, the fins are largely obstructed where these two fans sort of meet. Uh, fins are largely obstructed by that radion shroud. So that, that does limit the cooling capabilities, but some of the air can come out here. Some will come, NVIDIA does the same thing. They both do the same thing for aesthetics, and it's really not great for thermals uh, insofar as design. But for aesthetics, I guess you got to put the name somewhere, and that's where the card faces the user. So that's where it goes. So that covers the cooler, the PCB. We'll talk to Buildzoid, see if it's worth doing more depth on the PCB. So that's it. That's the AMD Radeon 7 Vega card for you. Uh, today, we're only allowed to talk about the card itself in a physical form. We can't talk performance numbers just yet. So that's the only thing that's really embargoed right now is the performance review. And for that, the card launches on the 7th, which is Thursday this week. So you could 
surmise when the review would go up. And that will be uh, with all of our performance numbers for gaming. Maybe we'll do some production this time as well. Uh, and then, of course, power overclocking and stuff like that. So, some interesting stuff in here for you. Mostly the thermal pad solution, the graphite pad. That's clearly a bit unique. How well it works, we'll find out. We have most of the data already, but I can't tell you what it is. So check back for more. Subscribe, as always, to catch that. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like the one I was working on here. They are shipping this week. We just got another round in. And uh, patreon.com slash gamersnexus helps out there as well. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.